Good evening and welcome to tonight's lockdown learning session. My name is Bren Carlil and I am the Public Affairs Director at the Zionist Federation of Australia. Our guest tonight is Ye'ir Golan. Ye'ir was drafted into the army in 1980 and joined the paratroopers. After serving in the Lebanon war, Ye'ir opted to become an officer uh, and he served, uh, and, and as he went through time, obviously he served in ever increasing uh, levels of seniority. He was the commander of the paratroopers anti-tank company. He led the 890 paratroop battalion and counter guerrilla operations in South Lebanon and in the first intifada. Um, he served as the uh, Jadir and Samiri Division's operations branch officer and so on and so forth. During cast led, he was the commander of the home front and uh, in July 2011, he led the Israeli Northern Command, finally becoming Deputy Chief of General Staff in December 2014. After he left the army, I believe in 2017, he turned to politics and in September last year joined the Knesset and is representing merits. Tonight, Yair is going to talk a little bit about Israel's security situation um, and then afterwards turn to Israeli politics and, of course, the new Israeli government. So without further ado, Yair, welcome. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I got your questions, well, probably a few of them. And one of them uh, was about why did I stay in the military for so many years? And uh, I would say it's a, it's a good starting point to say that uh, I think it's basically because of my family background, because of uh, some sort of a self-fulfillment and um, the public value of, uh, of service. Uh, and I would say the following. Uh, I grew up uh, in a family. Uh, my father, th that my father, you know, came from Germany, escaped Germany in 1935. Uh, my mother was born in uh, Israel. Uh, in fact, she is, she is uh, a decent, uh, well, uh, offspring of a family that came to to Palestine. Uh, during the first Aliyah, somewhere in 1884. And uh, I think that the values I got in uh, at home were about uh, public service, about, you know, serving the people, about serving the Zionist dream, uh, not about money, not about uh, property or any other, you know, physical material, you know, achievements. And uh, I think uh, I took it uh, very seriously, maybe too seriously. Uh, the other aspect is, you know, the self-fulfillment uh, of which is characterized, you know, every young people. Uh, and I got in the military uh, a sense of adventure, uh, not a dull moment in my life and the feeling of, you know, a challenge, of danger, of uh, some sort of, you know, extreme sport, uh, which is pretty much the same, I would say. Uh, and the, the last thing is the, is the sense of, uh, the sense of uh, public value, added value, uh, to feel that you are doing something which is important, something which is, uh, has more meanings than you know, just uh, serving yourself. And uh, that kept me in, in the military for 38 years. And that's what really uh, pushes me, you know, to, to the public arena. Uh, and I have to admit, although the political arena is much more frustrated comparing to the military one, uh, I feel the same, you know, uh, the same sense of uh, of doingness, of uh, of being meaningful, not for only for myself, but for the rest of the people here in Israel. Uh, so that's, you know, about my personal perspective. Uh, beside that, I'm married to Ruth. We have five sons. Uh, four of them uh, finished their service, military service up to now. Well, the fourth one is still in the military. Uh, two of my sons were 
officers in elite units. And the third one was a tank commander. And the fourth one is serving the intelligence, intelligence corps. And the fifth one is uh, just uh, 16 years old. And uh, hopefully, uh, he will finish his high school, you know, two years from now. Uh, so that's about my, my family. Uh, let me start with some uh, survey about the challenges, the, the security challenges of Israel. And I would like to start with Iran. Uh, no doubt that Iran is the most uh, challenging uh, foe concerning Israel. And before I start to, to, you know, to say anything about Iran, I would like to take you into the Iranian mind. And it goes like this. Um, Iran was uh, in the past three times an empire. Uh, the empire of uh, Xerxes uh, in the fifth, fourth uh, century uh, BC. Uh, you remember probably the story of Achashverosh and uh, Megillat Esther. And uh, therefore, you know, that was the empire, the empire of Marathon, the empire of uh, Salamis, uh, the struggle with the Hellenic empire. Uh, that's the story of the ancient time. Um, after that, there was the Sasanic uh, Empire from uh, the third uh, century AD to the seventh uh, century AD. And keep in mind that in uh, 614, uh, Palestine was uh, conquered by Persian troops uh, for a very short time because about 15 years later, the Muslims uh, came from uh, Saudi Arabia and in fact uh, established their empire uh, by eliminating the Persian empire, the Sasanic empire. And again, another empire between the, the 17th century to the 19th century, uh, sorry, from the 16th century to the 18th century. Uh, and in all these cases, Iran looked for the West, not for the East. Because in the East, there was you know, India and China and other formidable forces, while to the West, it was wide open. And um, this is the Iranian mind. So today, when Iran think about some sort of a regional hegemony, it's not uh, an illusion for, from their perspective, it's the right place in history. So they need to be influential. They need to be strong. They need to be at least a regional power and why not a worldwide power? This is the Iranian mind. But the problem is that when they do look to the West, what do they see there? Arabs, Arab people. And what is the best way to unify the Arab people uh, and make them supporting in Iran? Well, a common enemy. And the common enemy is, unfortunately, the Zionist project. And therefore, they have this sense of hostility toward Israel. Uh, well, I remember other days of Iran, uh, my father, uh, was the general manager of uh, of a firm in Israel called the uh, Telrad uh, communication uh, firm, and he worked, you know, for months in uh, Tehran, uh, building there the communication system. Back then, in seventy four, seventy five, so we had terrific relationship with Iran, but. Immediately after the Islamic revolution of 79, uh, it all ended. And now we have a deep, strong hostility relationship with the, with the Iranians, unfortunately. Um, how do they think about 
fighting Israel? Well, from the Iranian perspective, it's about attrition warfare. It's about weakening Israel from day to day, from month to month to month, from year to year. They have the patience. They know how to conduct long-term processes. So they know they cannot conquer Israel tomorrow morning. They know they cannot destroy Israel tomorrow, tomorrow morning. But first and foremost, they need to deter Israel and then to weakening Israel from year to year. So this is the overall perspective of, of the Iranians. Um, the first Iranian project in the region was started in, in, uh, was started in 1982 by establishing Hezbollah. Hezbollah, uh, the meaning in Arabic is the party of God. And the Hezbollah is the most prominent uh, entity which serve the Iranian cause. And I fought Hezbollah uh, through my life, uh, from 82 and up to, up to now. And Hezbollah is not just a terrorist organization. It's much more. Um, the capacities of the Hezbollah today is stronger for, you know, comparing to many other militaries, uh, official militaries uh, all over the world uh, with hundreds of long range missiles, with thousands of medium range missiles and with tens of thousands of rockets and of course, uh, mortar shells and uh, cannon shells. And the strategy of Hezbollah is not fighting the IDF in the front as much as threatening the home front, the civilian population, the civilian infrastructure. So they would like to create some sort of a de mutual deterrence with Israel while uh, conducting terror operations on a daily basis. Right now, they are in a situation of, I would say, much stability with Israel, not because this is their dream, but because there is a mutual deterrence and they were deeply involved in the Syrian civil war, uh, which um, Make them, made them, you know, um, investing heavily in fighting inside Syria. Um, this stability is fragile. This stability is temporary. Uh, and we need to be well prepared for any future confrontation with Hezbollah. And the only way to eliminate the threat upon the Israeli civilians is by invading Lebanon and destroying uh, much of the Hezbollah infrastructure, military infrastructure in southern Lebanon. There is no other way. You can trust me that, you know, I do understand my former profession and um, there is no possibility to eliminate the threat just by uh, firepower, mainly aerial firepower. Right now, the Iranians uh, try to do the same in Syria, but in Syria, it's much more complicated because Bashar al-Assad, uh, supreme leader of Syria, uh, the murderous uh, Bashar Assad is not a slave of uh, Iran. On the one hand, uh, without Iran, he could not survive. 
on the other hand, he does understand that an open, open confrontation with Israel could be devastating for his regime. So he tries to maneuver uh, between Iran and Israel, and on the one hand, enabling Iran, the Iranians to establish some sort of a basis, of frontal basis in Syria, and on the other hand, to control the Iranian operation in a way which won't bring Israel with its all full power upon him. Uh, so this is the, uh, the northern aspect of the Iranian threat. There is other uh, uh, aspect of the Iranian threat through Yemen. Uh, the Iranians are the greatest supporters of the Houthis, uh, the faction of uh, the Yemenites who live in mainly in northern Yemen, and they consider themselves as Shiites, and since they are Shias, their great su supporters, their, their great supported is Iran. Uh, here, there is no open confrontation between Israel and Yemen, but the threat concerning the Houthis is their ability to block uh, the Bab el Mandeb, the uh, naval gate uh, from the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean. Um, so overall, this is about Iran. Other element in the region, which uh, puts some limitations on the Iranians are the Russians. Uh, the Russians are heavily invested in Syria. They have their own port, naval port. They have their own uh, airfield uh, uh, in Khamimim in northern Syria, and uh, they want to see only one thing, the ability of Bashar Assad to consolidate his regime, um, to make him recontrol all the vast area of Syria. Um, they look at the Iranian presence as something which is beneficial for uh, Bashar Assad, but on the other hand, they don't want them, the Iranians, to be too, too strong. Uh, and they do believe that they play with all parties in a way which serve their interests. And the Russian interests are the following. First, for, first and foremost, uh, to build their own uh, stronghold in hot waters of the Mediterranean Sea. It is an uh, old, all day interest of Russia. And uh, right now, they have a lease contract for the next 50 years uh, to use some part of uh, Tartus, uh, the naval port. Uh, and that's according to their interest, it's crucial. But because the minute they manage to split their fleet, they can handle the Bosphorus and Turkey from both sides and therefore be much more strong uh, concerning any uh, future development. Uh, the other interest is to show the rest of the world that, that they are still a superpower and you cannot do anything in the world without Russia. And the third thing, the third, the third interest is to do anything which, which is possible against America. So if they manage to be more influential in some part of the world, more than the Americans, well, that's exactly according to the Russian interest. And I would say nothing is, is really new here it's, uh, I would say, uh, a traditional Russian approach. And who represents uh, better than Vladimir Putin, the Russian interests, uh, traditional interests. Um, America. Uh, the United States is well, 
the United States did some very bad investments uh, during the last 20 years, almost 20 years. No doubt that uh, September 11, 2001, um, took uh, the United States from being the, the sole and the lone superpower to a different place with the huge investments in the long war in Afghanistan and Iraq. In fact, the Americans lost their position in the world. Uh, they are still a formidable military superpower. But I would say that today, uh, many nations willing to challenge the Americans while knowing the weakest point of America. Uh, they don't want, the Americans don't want anymore to be heavily invested abroad. And making America great again is by going back to America, uh, working inside America, not outside America. And we need to understand this new world a world where China is a superpower, a world where the European Union is an influential entity, the Iranians, the Turkish, uh, the Russians, and maybe other nations. It's a matter of time, but no, no doubt that what we see today is the diminishing power of America. I have no intention to say that they cannot uh, replenish you know their power but uh, up to now and i would say as long as donald trump is a president uh, we won't see much american involvement in regional conflict around the globe um, so this is about america uh, the turks um, other one is maybe the most prominent uh, populist leader in the world uh, is leading a group of leaders who are heavily invested in this pop, uh, populist uh, approach uh, to leadership. Uh, I don't like this approach at all. I consider Benjamin Netanyahu as one of them, as Donald Trump as one of them, but Unfortunately, this is, this is our modern world. And he also play with very weak cards, a very blunt game. Uh, he has no problem to threaten Europe. He has no problem to threaten Egypt. He, have, he tried to threaten Russia and got uh, a punch in his nose and since then he's okay with them uh, but uh, we need to understand that the other one also like the iranians uh, think about turkey as a, as a regional power uh, as an entity you cannot ignore in the region and from his perspective uh, is heavily humiliated by the europeans and therefore, he'll look to the East rather than to the West. Uh, he'll look for uh, alliances with Iran, uh, temporary alliances with other nations in the region, with Egypt, with Libya, uh, with Algeria. No matter, you know, we'll look at the, at the Mediterranean Sea as his, his background, uh, backyard, sorry is his backyard and therefore he need to be an influential player uh, in this arena um egypt and jordan we have a solid yeah, yeah, just before we turn down to egypt and jordan can i just um ask a question louder about... please uh sorry please just before we it. just before we go down to egypt and jordan i was hoping to ask a question about some of your comments about iran and syria and in particular um, you mentioned that uh, Hezbollah is currently a bit, uh, the, the fragility, you so said the fragility that Hezbollah is currently sustained won't end. Do you think that their fighting in Syria will end up being 
worse for them than anything else. I mean, they, they were fighting a ragbag bunch of a bunch of rebels and Sunni jihadis. They were supported sometimes um, with with Iran or with Russian air power. Um, they were, you know, they've had obviously a lot of combatant deaths and a lot of permanent injuries. Do you think that the negatives for Hezbollah in Syria will outweigh the positives? Yes, I say that the, the situation is, is a bit fragile because uh, the main effort of the Hezbollah and Iran today is to improve the rocket rockets uh, arsenal of the Hezbollah and make it uh, a missiles uh, arsenal. Uh, it's not very complicated. Uh, with small kits about this size, you can change any, every, any rockets to be an accurate missile. And that could be a formidable threat for Israel because by moving from rockets, a static, statistics a weapon, and make it an accurate weapon, uh, we have the ability to hit any target uh, with the accuracy of uh, 10 meters, 5 meters, 2 meters, it just depends on the mechanism of the accuracy uh, part. Uh, you can threat any Israeli infrastructure. And keep in mind that Israel is a very small country. Uh, do you have any idea how many power plants we have in Israel? About 15. How many hospitals? This proper, pretty much yeah, the yeah. same number. Uh, five uh, desalination uh, uh, facilities all along the coast. You know, it's very easy to neutralize Israel and to take Israel uh, 50 years back in its, in its uh, infrastructure because um, the, the range is quite close. Um, and because in order to neutralize any infrastructure, you don't need much. But you it's said, not... you said, and I, I basically agree with you that the only way to 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 basically end uh, uh, destroy Hezbollah's infrastructure is is a ground invasion of Lebanon because because an aerial combat such as what happened in two thousand and six is just not going to work. But do, do your merits think... go on? Let Let me just finish. You know. Uh, um, so we'll look at the accuracy project of the Hezbollah as a very serious threat. And we try on a daily basis to scrutinize this, this, uh, this process. Uh, they try to do the opposite. And therefore there is a friction, a constant friction and hidden uh, friction, uh, a clandestine friction between Israel and the Hezbollah between Israel and Iran. And therefore I say that the situation is quite fragile. Uh, none, of, none of the parties is willing to have a war, an open war tomorrow morning. That's for sure. But when I look at the last three operations in the Gaza Strip and the second Lebanon war, we didn't want three of the four. So in most cases, in our modern time, even if you don't plan any major operation, and, if you even, and even if you don't want a major operation, you are going to face it because you have other parties in the, uh, on the field and they have different perspective, different interests. And in some cases, none of the parties uh, is willing to conduct a war, but we find ourselves in a war. Uh, by the way, pretty much like uh, the process which led to the First World War. Uh, and, you know, we, 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 a world war with, with no nation which had a clue about what is going to be there in this you know coming war so therefore the situation is 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 very sensitive even today 
Do your colleagues in Merits agree with you that a ground invasion of Lebanon is really the only uh, proper strategy? I would, in a, in say, that, I, I would say the following. Uh, I don't think that uh, politicians really deal with the operational aspect, how to eliminate a threat. Uh, I'm a, a bit a, a strange phenomenon in Meretz because I think that there was no prominent uh, military figure in Meretz in the last, well, since the establishment of, of Meretz. Uh, maybe Ran Cohen was with, you know, more uh, military background, but uh, Abu Vilan was in the, with a the military background, but none of them was a, was a general. So uh, what I try to bring to the Zionist left of Israel is a different approach, is to say that, yes, we are left, but we are more anxious than anyone else about the security of Israel. We know better than anyone how to put together diplomacy and military power. We understand that then better than anyone else, the relationship between statehood and the uh, military uses. Uh, so we have more, uh, I would say, um, um, well-developed approach to the security challenges of Israel. We know better how to put everything together, economy, diplomacy, military power, uh, regional interests, uh, dealing with superpowers and regional power in more sophisticated manner. Uh, that's what I try to, to, to bring to the, to the political arena. And concerning that, I think it's a, it, it is quite an, a, a unique approach. Well, this might be um, a time to turn to the government. I know we haven't uh, spoken about Egypt, but I but I do want to get your opinion on uh, particularly the, the West Bank and uh, and obviously the new government's approach to to the West Bank. Um, first of all, it looks like Gantz is going to be defence minister. Do you do you, what do you think? Do you think he's be a good defence minister? Let me say let me say a few words about the Palestinian arena in a whole, not just about the West Bank. Um, we need to think differently about the Palestinian issue. Why? Uh, the Oslo approach was about having uh, negotiations uh, with one entity, then Yasser Arafat, uh, who represents uh, all the Palestinian people and in a manner of making a peace accord like we have with Egypt and Jordan. That was in the mind of uh, Rabin and Paris back then during the 90s. Um, this approach is pretty much irrelevant today because the Palestinians are well divided between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. And we don't know how to make them you know, unified again. And in effect, it's not a matter of Israel interest or Israeli activity. Uh, there are people who think that we can influence their willingness to unify themselves. But I believe it's untrue. Uh, you cannot force them to be unified. And therefore, it's their own internal business. Uh, we need to keep in mind that along the history of the Palestinians, they never ever managed to unify themselves in a reasonable way. Uh, by the way, it's uh, the greatest luck of Israel. Um, so we need to admit that it's very hard to reach uh, a point where we restart a bilateral process with the Palestinians uh, and that could be a terrible disaster for Israel because if they, the Palestinians, do nothing and we do not do nothing like we do today, 
Uh, the end will be uh, one state for two nations. And that's a terrific recipe for future violence, terrible violence. It's a terrific recipe for a civil war. Uh, I'm not exaggerating the, the, the severity of the situation, not at all. Uh, along my life, I learn, you know, in depth the issue of uh, civil wars and internal conflicts. And I can tell you with the level of animosity between Israelis and Palestinians, we need to separate them. We need high walls in order to start a process of reconciliation, a long process of reconciliation, which could take decades maybe centuries, I don't know. So but does this separation mean, mean uh, does this separation mean no workers come into, uh, come into Israel from Gaza or the West Bank? Like there, there's complete economic separation? What does separation yeah, look like? I, I, what I, I like to say, well, there is no separation, economical separation between the Gaza and the West Bank, but there is an ongoing, you know, um, uh, commercial relationship between them. But we need to prepare the ground for any future separation. Therefore, I'm against annexation. Therefore, I'm against any future uh, settlements along, well, beside uh, Palestinians, uh, Palestinian population. And therefore, I need, I think we need to portray the future borders of Israel tomorrow morning. It's not a very unique approach. And that was the approach of Ariel Sharon as a, as a prime minister. Think about the following. And Ariel Sharon was uh, the leader of the Likud for many years. Uh, the father of the settlements and the godfather of the settlers. And uh, it was the most beloved person in Israeli politics by the settlers. But when he was nominated as a prime minister, he did, underst he did understand that there is no other choice for Israel. With the responsibility on his shoulders, he felt during that time, there is no way to secure Israeli destiny, but by separating ourselves from the Palestinians. And he did it unilaterally. And many people even today condemn him for doing that. I praise him for doing that. I think that uh, he was wise enough to understand during that time that the Palestinians are too weak after years of of fighting Israel during the Second Intifada. He understood that Abu Mazen is too weak to consolidate enough power and to make the West Bank secured place for both Palestinians and Israelis. And therefore he moved forward unilaterally, but by doing that, he solved the problem in a way, he solved the problem of the, of the Gaza Strip and create better situation in the West Bank. Unfortunately, uh, by his stroke, uh, the, the process was ended. Uh, unfortunately, no one was strong enough in Israel, in the Israeli political system to renew this process. But I'm totally uh, convinced that there is no other way but to separate ourselves from the Palestinians. I prefer doing that uh, bilaterally or even multilaterally, but I have no intention to give my destiny uh, to the hands of the Palestinians or others. And therefore, with no other choice, I have, I have no hesitation to take some unilateral measures in order to put strong boundaries between 
Israelis and Palestinians. But a couple of years ago, the, the Labour leader... The only, the only positive um, uh, possibility, for option for Israel. And I heard about, you know, other other ideas like, you know, having federation with the, with the uh, Palestinians. Uh, I, would like I would like to say concerning that, that I don't know around the globe uh, a case, a successful uh, case study where with such a level of animosity, you create a federation. No, I agree I with you. <laughs> yeah. but, but, you know, um, if, if, if you're a Palestinian and you heard that, um, that the new Merits government basically said, um, if, if they don't negotiate with us, we'll unilaterally withdraw, why would they bother negotiating? Look, they won't negotiate with us if we try to annex them. That's for sure. Um, they won't negotiate with us why we say, all right, we just freeze the situation. No other, you know, we are not, we are not going to move any settlements. We are not going to do anything behalf of you. Uh, we don't, we have no good intention uh, to show you, but we freeze the situation. They won't take it. If we want to move forward, we need to do something which say the Palestinians, all right, we are willing to move forward. We want you to be with us. But if you won't go with us, we are going to do it by, our, by ourselves. There is no other way to convince them to join us. We need to see, or we need to acknowledge the weaknesses of the Palestinian system. And there are many weaknesses in the Palestinian system. And therefore, we need to do, we need to take the initiative, the assumption that they should take the initiative is wrong, because uh, only the strong party could take the initiative. And that's what we need to do. It's like, you know, when I, I can, you know, uh, compare it to the situation with Egypt back then in 77. Only when uh, Anwar Sadat felt that he is strong enough, after the Yom Kippur War, after, after the armistice agreement with Israel, only then, with the feeling that America is with him, he managed to take the initiative. Initiative is a symbol of strength. And we are so strong and we don't take the initiative. That's make me crazy. That's the reason why I entered the political system. So what do you think do of Gantt's initiative gain, to, to join Netanyahu? Do, do we gain initiative in the Israeli political system and make, make you know, any Israeli government to move forward in order to solve the Palestinian issue in any possible way? any possible but, way, which is according to our moral standards. So, so what about Trump's way? No, it's not, it's not the Trump <laughs> plan, not at all, not at all. The, the Trump plan, there is, no, there is no Trump plan, I want to tell you, nothing like that. It, it's just, you know, a, a public affair issue. It's not a serious plan. It's not a serious plan because if you want to solve the problem, you need to bring both parties to the table. And in this case, only the Israeli show up. So there is no, from my perspective, there is no such a plan. And of course, you cannot start moving, you cannot convince the Palestinians to join the process by, from the starting point of annexing 30% uh, of Judea and Samaria. It, it's, it's such a stupid thing to do. Uh, and, what, and for what? We gain nothing by formal annexation. Uh, the formal annexation of the Golan Heights uh, didn't hamper uh, then Prime Minister Barak to start uh, negotiations with the, with the Syrians 
and back then in 1999. Do so you this think, is totally not the issue. Do you think in July the annexation will actually go ahead? Do you think Gantz will find a way to stop Netanyahu or is Gantz going to let it go well, ahead? My feeling is that, uh, that Bibi will do nothing. Why? Because the issue of annexation is, is best called concerning negotiating with the extreme right in Israel, with the religious right in Israel. So if you annex Judea and Samaria, then you have no more cards. So I, I don't think that is, is, a, is, a, is really serious concerning that. Therefore, there are some limitations on this measure. Like, you know, we need uh, 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 the approval of the United States. We need the diplomatic uh, suitable situation to do it and other limitations, which enabling him to say to the settlers or the, to the extreme right, uh, well, I'm going to do it, but not right now, because this is not the most appropriate time. I want to turn to a question from the audience. Philip Cohen has asked um, if we could ask you if you think that Israel's offshore gas discoveries, which, as you know, are both on the border of, uh, of particularly Lebanon, um, do, do you think that could help or hinder peace efforts between Palestinians and also Lebanon? Well, the gas is a neutral entity. It serves positive, uh, positive goals and negative goals at the same time. Uh, for instance, we provide Jordan gas, and, and it's wonderful. It stabilizes our relationship with the Jordanians. Uh, we have an agreement with Egypt right now concerning uh, uh, providing them uh, more gas. It's a stabilizing uh, issue. But we have a conflict with Lebanon concerning uh, some of the under seabed gas fields. So that could create a war be between Israel and Lebanon. So I, I won't say that, you know, that the uh, uh, gas necessarily is a positive or negative issue in the region uh, it's the matter of people how they use the gas for positive or negative purposes speaking of war leon kingston has asked whether you think war is inevitable with the uh, the regional powers i guess particularly iran and its proxies do you think is it possible to deter hezbollah indefinitely I would say the following, uh, Iran will be a prominent uh, figure in the region for the next decades. Um, and unless we see a major change inside Iran, this approach, this policy won't be changed. Uh, the likelihood for internal change in Iran, uh, from my perspective, is not very high. Uh, there are people who are willing to see the uprising of the Iranian people. Uh, I don't think it, we are so close to this. Uh, the frustration and uh, the frustration in the in the Iranian population need to be much higher in order to reach some sort of a major uprising, not like what we saw in 2009, not some like what we saw in you know, two years ago. Uh, we need more energy in the people in order to change the regime. Um, so we need to prepare for a future conflict. And at the same time, uh, working very hard with the United States, with Russia, with other powers, in order to uh, weaken Iran as much as possible. 
And I would say that the economical measures are the most influential, influential one and the most effective one. Uh, yes, we need to uh, approve over and over again that Iran is a terrorist entity which support terror activity in the region and around the globe. Anything I say concerning that is true and we can approve it. And many other nations uh, do know that uh, this is the truth. And we need to work uh, hard in order to curtail Iranian efforts, global efforts uh, to export the Iranian revolution. But Iran has been hammered. It, it's, it's, its economy has been hammered by the, the renewed sanctions, by COVID-19, um, by now by the low price of oil, and yet it continues supporting its regional proxies. Uh, Speak up. Speak, oh, please. Sorry. sorry, sorry. I was just saying, the, the, at what point will the Iranian, like, like the, you say the economic way is the only way to to change Iranian policy, but they have been hammered their economy their, by the sanctions, by COVID nineteen, by the low price of oil. But they continue supporting their proxies. It, you know, is there a point, economically speaking, where Iran will abandon its proxies or at least lessen their support and and actually shore up their defenses at home? Well, it's so hard to predict it. Uh, I would say it's almost impossible. We are entering all the world to uh, some sort of uh, economical crisis, no doubt. What will be the implications upon Iran? I don't know. I truly don't know. Uh, I would say the following. Any time of a major economical crisis is a very sensitive time. Uh, so we need to wait and see but I won't be surprised to find Israel in a, or in a much better situation concerning our regional stand or in much worse uh, situation concern, concerning our regional stand. Um, but I do know we are in a time of change, of a major change, no doubt. Speaking of change, how do you think Netanyahu has been handling the COVID-19 crisis? Well, if you compare Israel uh, to other nations around the globe, we are doing well. Well, reasonable. No doubt, reasonable. But keep in mind that Israel is one of the best well-prepared nations upon earth for emergencies, well, concerning that, my expectations were higher. We could do it better. We could have done it better up to now. And unfortunately, uh, we took some measures which were too harsh, too comprehensive and too devastating to the Israeli economy. Uh, I think that uh, first and foremost, we need better intelligence about the threat and that by making more and more checks in order to understand where are the most uh, sensitive areas in Israel and where we can feel more confidence by um, freeing the, the daily life uh, procedures um, and moving from emergency situation to some sort of regular life. Uh, so it's about intelligence, it's about protective measures. Uh, the Israeli government should have uh, delivered any Israeli citizens with all the protection, with all protecting uh, measures, masks and alcohol gel and uh, gloves and everything which is needed. Uh, it costs nothing. 
uh, and we should provide it to the Israeli citizens in every street corner. Uh, the third issue is about adopting some sort of a regional approach, local approach rather than nationwide approach. Uh, and hopefully we will see uh, signs of this approach in the next few days and weeks. And we need to work much stronger with the Home Front Command. I know the Home Front Command uh, very intimately even because I commanded this command for more than three years. Um, and I think we, that up to now we didn't use much of the Home Front Command capacities, capacities and capabilities and uh, that was wrong. So there were some good decisions and some bad decisions and basically we could do it better and we should do it better in the next few weeks in order to lessen the impact of the disease upon the Israeli society. We've only got a couple of more minutes left. So I just uh, want to ask you about Yom Hazikaron. It, it begins tomorrow night. Uh, this is going to be a very different year this year. How will you be marking Yom HaZikaron tomorrow night and on Tuesday? I, I didn't hear the, the questions. Did, I'm so sorry about that. Yom HaZikaron is this is this Tuesday. How will you be marking it on Tuesday, given the isolation that all Israelis are under? I think it's a shame that we prevent citizens from going to the military graveyards. Uh, cemeteries are open spaces with not a formidable threat. Uh, we could divide the day, you know, for hours and making citizens, you know, going in different hours uh, from different gates and uh, making, you know, the local uh, governments, the local mayors responsible for conducting this operation in the most secured manner. Uh, we could do it better. We could use uh, Yom HaZikaron, the Memorial Day, as a starting point for the normality, as a starting point for uh, to symbolize solidarity in the Israeli population and moving forward from this day on in order to normalize uh, Israeli life. That's my opinion. Not everyone agree with me in Israel, but uh, I think that I do understand uh, what is the emergency situation in the civilian uh, population and how to handle it in the most uh, responsible way. By the way, you cannot keep this uh, level of tension for more than five, six, six weeks. The tension is deteriorating no matter what you are doing. So in order, so it's much, it's, it's much wiser to take this uh, natural momentum and work with it in order to do it in the most controlled way. Because if formally you keep emergency situation, but practically people start not to obey to the, to the regulations and to the rules, then it's the most dangerous situation. So we need to lessen the, 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 the threat, to lessen the severity of the, of the situation, working with the population, with the natural uh, rhythms of uh, the population in order to provide them a sense of controlled process. And this is one of the greatest, the greatest, greatest assets of any government is to provide the population a sense of controlling. We know what to do. We know when to do. We, not, we know why to do uh, anything we have done. And you can trust us. Um, thank you. Um... I, I, the only reason I'm wrapping up is because we're at the end of our hour. 
Um, I could have spoken with you for another couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for your for your time today. Uh, you're you're at the Knesset right now. It is a working day, and so I appreciate that you've taken an hour out of your day. I know that um, everyone listening or watching through Facebook will be similarly grateful. Thank you so much. Um, to those who are watching, as you know, Yom Hazikaron will be uh, marked from tomorrow evening. Uh, also in Australia, we don't have public ceremonies, but the various Zionist federations, the Zionist Federation of New Zealand, Zionist Council of New South Wales, Zionist of Victoria, State Zionist Council of Western Australia, and even Masa Israel Journey all have online Yom HaZikaron uh, uh, ceremonies that you can watch. Uh, go to their Facebook pages for details and you will find them there. Most of them can start add at one, 7 p.m. One more thing? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, I would like to sum up by saying that the Memorial Day in Israel, for me personally, is probably the most important day in the Israeli calendar. And in this day, I, with the families, uh, with my soldiers, with my comrades, who didn't manage to, to, to come back from uh, our combat fields. And in this day, I feel, uh, that all it's needed is to be with them, is to feel them, is to be silent with them, and to show the families that we never forget, and we will never forget uh, the terrible price for keeping our independence. Uh, so thank you very much for joining this uh, conversation. I apologize for my terrible English, but that's what I have. It's perfect. And, uh, no worries at all. Thank you I so much once again. That, I, I want you to know that I consider the relationship between Israel and the diaspora as a very crucial element in the security of Israel. Uh, it's not about the bonding between Jews all over the globe. It's about the security of Israel. And uh, no matter what is the political situation today in Israel, we are going to fix it. We need to be optimistic. Uh, we need to work hard in order to put Israel back on the rails of liberal democracy with modern approach to life, with much respect to its history and heritage. So thank you very much again. Thank you.